For regular videos on ancient cultures and forgotten civilizations, please subscribe. When Herodotus visited Egypt in the 5th century BCE, the Egyptian priest told him that the first king of Egypt was a man named Nin, and that he had founded Memphis and built a dam there. About a century and a half later, the Egyptian priest and historian Manetho wrote that the first dynasty of Egypt was founded by Minias, or Menes, of the city of Thys, and that he met his end by being eaten by a hippopotamus. And we do have evidence that this name was part of Egyptian tradition for some time. In the Turin Canon, the Abydos King List, and the reliefs of the Ramesseum, all coming from the New Kingdom period, centuries before Herodotus. Meni, Menes, is referred to as the first king. But no archaeological evidence for the existence of Menes has ever been found, and he is not mentioned in a clearly royal context until the New Kingdom, over a thousand years after he is said to have lived. So, controversy still exists over who Menes was and whether there really was a real person by that name. What evidence do we have for and against? And what possible explanations for the story are there? Find out as we examine the mystery of King Menes. I suppose the first question we have to answer is, what is our oldest ever reference to Menes in Egyptian documents? The earliest mention of Menes is often said to be an 18th dynasty scarab that shows the name of Menes in a cartouche supported by a winged scarab beetle above a kneeling god holding in each outstretched hand a papyrus plant on which the juxtaposed cartouches of Hatshepsut and Thutmose III appear. Scholars usually interpreted this as an effort by Hatshepsut to legitimize her rule by associating herself with the founder king. Recently, however, the authenticity of the scarab has been questioned. If confirmed as a forgery, the oldest document that mentions Menes in a clearly royal context would be the Abydos king list of Seti I. It dates to around 1300 BCE. Uh, Menes, mind you, would have lived somewhere around 3000 BCE. So because Menes is not mentioned in a clearly royal context until the New Kingdom, several theories interpret the name Menes as being something other than the name of an actual ruler and instead propose that it is an invention of the New Kingdom. The most prominent of these theories states that the name Menes is based on the use of the sign Min, to designate someone or so-and-so, a person whose name is not known. Which means that if the name of the first king of the first dynasty had been forgotten when the king lists were compiled, uh, something would have to be put in its place. So they stuck in Min, so-and-so, king so-and-so. <laughs> uh, another proposal is that Menes is indeed a name, but that he is a mythical figure and we shouldn't assume he is historical. But the fact that the names of four of the eight kings of the first dynasty can be confirmed by contemporary documents and a fifth by an old kingdom document makes it unlikely that the compilers of the new kingdom king lists would be right about five of the eight kings of the first dynasty, but ignorant about the most important of all those kings, the founder king, Menes. Here's a list of the kings of the first dynasty as found by archaeologists. And here's the list of kings in the first dynasty as stated in the Abydos King List. The Abydos King List only has eight main kings instead of nine, but Mernit was a woman, so they probably left her out. Here is the list of Manetho. As you can see, they don't match up very well, but keep four things in mind. One, the names are Hellenized, that is in Greek form. Two, they have probably been corrupted by being passed down from generation to generation over 2,000 years. Three, different versions of Manetho have survived to today, and they have alternate spellings. And four, Egyptian kings had more than one name. But we need to be careful in assuming automatically 
that we have a one-to-one -one correspondence with these names. Something that makes this issue more complicated is that the first king of the first dynasty was not, as you might think, the first Egyptian monarch. The evolution of Egyptian kingship was a slow and laborious process, which began before the first dynasty by at least a few centuries. And there were a couple of minor kings of the first dynasty, which might come into play too. But considering that there were earlier kings, why was Menes selected by tradition as the first king? The most plausible reason is that Menes accomplishments distinguished him from his predecessors, right? He must have done something special. So one thing we can do is examine the documentary and archeological evidence associated with the main achievements attributed to Menes and attempt to determine whether there is a known king or kings that can be linked to those achievements. In royal Egyptian thinking and imagery, the idea of Egypt's unity was of the utmost importance. We now know that the ceremony of recreating the union shown on the Palermo stone was part of the king's coronation and that it was practiced for more than 1500 years. Mene's unification of Egypt is not mentioned by either Herodotus or Manetho. However, there is evidence that he received credit for this achievement uh, in the New Kingdom, at least. We can see a scene of priests bringing sculptures of monarchs with labels bearing their names in front of them in the mortuary temple of Ramses II. The first three kings are Menes, Mentuhotep II, and Amosa I. Mentuhotep and Amosa are respectively the unifiers of Egypt after the first and second intermediate periods and founders of the Middle and New Kingdoms. It is interpreted, therefore, that Menes was considered the first unifier of Egypt. Given that the concept of unification was so important in ancient Egypt, it is likely that Menes' association with unification was the primary reason he was considered the first king. According to tradition, the Egyptian state was formed out of two pre-dynastic kingdoms, Upper and Lower Egypt. The concept of the Egyptian state was expressed throughout all periods and countless sources as a union of two previously separate individual kingdoms, Upper Egypt and Lower Egypt. It's in this context we need to introduce a recurring character when talking about early dynastic Egypt, someone named Narmer. His name comes to us via several sources, both historical and archeological. He is cited in contemporary sources. Narmer was, just like Menes, considered the first king of a unified Egypt, and he is well known for the renowned Narmer Palette, which contains one of the earliest signs of kingship and propaganda in ancient Egypt. The recto of the palette is dominated by the image of Narmer wearing the white crown of Upper Egypt in the classic pose of smiting the enemy. The prisoner is about to kneel almost naked in front of him, to the right of the prisoner's head are two hieroglyphs, a harpoon and a lake, which have been read as the name of the Harpoon Province, the northwestmost territory of the Delta adjacent to Libya. That's Lower Egypt. Facing the king above the prisoner is the falcon god Horus, who holds a rope that passes through the nose of a human head. The head is attached to the land hieroglyph, from which six papyrus plants grow. The usual interpretation of this scene is that Horus is delivering the land of the papyrus, that is the delta, to the king. On the verso, Narmer is shown wearing the red crown of Lower Egypt, marching in a procession to two rows of decapitated prisoners, above which are four symbols, a door, a bird, a boat with upturned ends, and a falcon on a harpoon. There are several differing interpretations of these symbols, but they all involve some combination of the Harpoon Province, Lake Mariotis, which is in the Harpoon Province, and or Buto, which is in the territory next to the Harpoon Province. Regardless, they all refer to the West Delta. In the Narmer year label, the event represented designates the most significant event of the year, making it the earliest year label found in Egypt. On the upper right, is Narmer's name in a Sarek. The year event is indicated to the left of the Sarek by means of a catfish, that's King Narmer, 
with arms, one of which swings a mace while the other clutches a fallen enemy by a clump of papyrus growing out of his head. Below the catfish is a chisel, completing the name of Narmer. The fallen enemy is determined by the pot hieroglyph, like the one on the Narmer cylinder. The year event on the label is the smiting of the papyrus people, which corresponds to the people of the West Delta, referred to on the palette. On both sides of the palette, Narmer is shown wearing the crowns of both Upper and Lower Egypt, and is the first king to do so. This changes the report of simply a military victory into a claim of completing the unification of Egypt, becoming the first king of a united country. This historical interpretation is strengthened by the importance Narmer put on the event. We know he considered it an important event because of the impressiveness of the Narmer palette, because he named a year after it, and because at least two other important objects of his reign were devoted to it. An ivory cylinder and the inlaid container of which fragments were found around Narmer's tomb at Abydos. In addition, the Narmer mace head probably refers to the event's aftermath. There is no other example in the early dynastic period of an event being given this level of importance. The interpretation of the crowns in Narmer's palette have changed a bit in the last few decades, and although Narmer may not necessarily have been the only king responsible for unifying Egypt, uh, there is strong evidence that he took part <laughs> in one of the stages of that unification by taking the West Delta. And he claimed for himself in very prominent ways that he was the unifier of Egypt. Curiously, this is the same role attributed to Menes, which suggests, to some extent, that they were the same person. Another hypothesis on the question of who exactly Menes was can be traced back to the discovery of the famous Nakada label in the great Mastaba tomb in Nakada in the end of the 19th century. The tomb was originally thought to be that of Menes and is often still referred to as the tomb of Menes, but it has since been attributed to Nithotep, a queen consort of the early first dynasty. The misunderstanding was caused by a triple enclosure with a triangular roof in the top register. Inside are a vulture and a snake, each sitting on a basket, assumed to represent the two ladies, the goddesses Nekbet and Wajet, that represent Upper and Lower Egypt. To the left of the triple structure is the name of Aha in a Serek. Two other names for Aha, but not in Serex, appear on the other side of the enclosure. Egyptologists then interpreted the symbols in the triple enclosure as being the name of King Menes, and since it was next to the name Aha, he concluded that they were the same person. Hence, Aha was Menes. Further interpretation of the tomb, as well as the increase in our understanding of early hieroglyphs, have shown that the enclosure was actually a shrine and that the symbols inside it represent the name of the shrine, not at all related to the debate of the identity of King Menes or any other king. Determining whether Menes was the personal name of Narmer or of Aha has occupied much of the research in this topic in the last several decades. The establishment of Memphis, the Nakara label, the Narmer prince's seal, the Palermo stone, all of them failed to prove whether Narmer or Aha was Menes. The Abydos necropolis ceilings provide direct, near contemporary evidence in favor of Narmer. The impressions of two cylinder seals were found during the clearance of the tomb of Den, the best attested ruler of the early dynastic period. The reconstructed seal contains the Horus names of five kings in order. Narmer, Aha, Jer, Jet, and Den. Assuming Narmer was the first king of the first dynasty, these are the first five kings of that dynasty. The king's names are not in Serex, but each is headed by a Horus falcon, a clear sign of royalty in ancient Egypt. What we can definitely say is that by the death of Den, the fifth king of the first dynasty, Egyptian officials had made the decision to begin the list of kings included in the royal mortuary cult at Abydos with Narmer. It's important to realize that this was a decision, not an inevitability, as earlier kings were buried at Umm el-Kab, and it's unlikely that they were already forgotten. 
Over a thousand years later in the New Kingdom, the name Narmer was forgotten, and instead we find the name Menni. In all the king lists of that period, he is named as the first king. And over a thousand years after that, when Manetho composed his history, Menes is again listed as the first king. But we still cannot be 100% sure that he's identical with Narmer. It is entirely possible that Narmer was forgotten early on, and then Meni was added to the list later as a mythical founder, having nothing to do with Narmer. It is also possible that Meni is the name of a king immediately before or after Narmer. It's still a mystery, but it is possible that this matter could be cleared up in the future. We just need another find. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you'd like to support the channel and help keep it alive, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash world of antiquity. Or if you want to make a one-time contribution, you can do that with a super thanks. See you next time. You might like my little e-booklet, Why Ancient History Matters. It's designed to persuade people that the subject is important, even in the modern world. You might also wish to use it to help spread the word. So feel free to share it with someone you know. It's free for anyone who wants it. I've left the link in the description box below the video for you to grab a copy. Catch you later.